Okay, so it looks like we are we are getting some people. I'm gonna start tweeting, try to get a couple stragglers to come in as Great. well. All right, so it's time to start our next session. Uh, share channels, new kids on the block. We have David and Joy, and I will let you do proper introduction and the floor <laughs> is yours. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks, Tom. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, big kudos, shout out to Synology, a uh, big sponsor for today's event. We wouldn't be able to do these things without uh, their great help. So uh, we'll do a quick round of intros here, and it looks like we'll be doing conversation through the Q&A. So make sure you use that feature. If you haven't used it before, just punch a question in there, and then it gets kind of made visible to everyone else, and Joy and I can answer it. Um, I'm David. Uh, most of the time, I just default to Francoeur. I, I do have a French background, so Francoeur is the right way to say my last name, but most people struggle with that. So I've been in this space for uh, 10, 10, 15 years, consulting product side. Now um, I'm the director of product delivery at Orchestry and work in teams pretty much every day. So this was a great topic of, of great interest to many of our customers and one that I've been wanting to talk about. And I was fortunate that Joy wanted to uh, talk about this with me. Yes, I just like to talk, so it's an excuse <laughs> to do it. Uh, but I see some familiar names. I wish I were seeing familiar faces, but we'll we'll stick with names today. Uh, good to see you all again. Uh, if we've never met face to face, I am the joy of SharePoint online. <laughs> so I hope you'll connect with me. Uh, SharePoint is my first IT love. Uh, I've been in the Microsoft space for about 15 years. Most of that as a trainer and a consultant. I've now moved over to the dark side of product development, and I love it. I'm the customer and partner success director at Orchestry. Woohoo! And it's okay. been great having you. It's been short, but already <laughs> great. Many great things have been achieved. One and a half. <laughs> All right, so what are we going to talk about? So first of all, it's very nice to meet everyone. We're getting close to the holidays. We'll keep this pretty relaxed today. But there's a lot to unpack with shared channels, as Joy already alluded to. It sounds simple on the surface. It's one of those things where you peel back the layers of the onion and there's more and more to find out. And you kind of wonder what's left there of value that I can use. So we'll talk about that. We'll look a little bit at the technicalities, but this is not really meant to be a technical deep dive into all the configuration options you can turn on and off. There's a lot of documentation on that. We'll kind of breeze through that piece to make sure you understand the basics, but we'll kind of then make sure that, that you have some, some resources to go and, uh, and follow if you need to turn this on. But I think most importantly, what do you want to take away from this is how would you potentially use this or pitch this internally? And Joy and I have some ideas on that, whether or not you use it externally or just internally, there's some interesting use cases for both and we'll go through those and that's where I hope we can get a bit of a conversation going. All right, so maybe I'll start with the uh, first couple of slides here on the history and then I'll toss it over to you, Joy. So I think if uh, you're new to shared channels, you haven't heard sh the word shared channels, or maybe you're familiar with the, the other previous way that it was described called uh, Teams Connect, you might have kind of been struggling to piece all of this together. So really quickly, really high level, when we're talking about teams, we have these building blocks that we can use to structure our teams, right? We have channels. We have standard channels. They kind of then release private channels. And now we have this new thing called a shared channel. So what is a shared channel and how would it fit in? Oh, right, it's the new kid on the block. So we had to put a picture. Joy put a great picture of new kids on the block. You're for those welcome. of you who are of our generation. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. So. Um, I'll start and then I'll toss it over to you, Joy. So I think um, when we look at a team, right, the team is kind of this big building block where we manage the membership, right? So we have a bunch of people in our team, could be a project team, right? We have 10 or 15 people in that team. Then we could start to branch out that team into channels, right? So we might have a design, an execution, a, a planning channel where we're segregating out the content and the conversation. Now, what these do by default is that they inherit the membership or the permissions, and that's the real important part. So instead of having to manage membership for each of these independently, pain in the butt, you manage them in one place up here and they all get inherited down to those channels. Where private channels came in is this kind of subset idea. It's like, well, 
not everyone in the team should see this information, maybe just the management, maybe it's to do with dollar figures and that's a bit sensitive. So we're gonna create this as a private channel, which is then a subset, which is why I have a dotted line here of the original members of the team, right? And then we have this new idea here of shared channels. What is that? Again, we kind of have this dotted line off of the main team because likely it will not necessarily involve everyone that's part of the main team, it could, but it's definitely going to involve some new people as well. And that's the main difference between the private and the shared. Private, you cannot introduce new people into it that don't exist in the original team, but with a shared channel, you can. Anything else we can add here, Joy? One of the things that I say over and over and over again when I'm presenting, teaching, consulting, whatever, is that when you're thinking about teams, if you're in the team, you're on the team by the de by default, whether you're a guest, a member, an owner, you're a contributor, you're an editor, all those things. Private channels and shared channels let you create cubby holes that add to or take away from, depending on what the intended purpose is. So that, that's just something to keep in mind as we go throughout. When we wrap up, we're gonna talk about the best time to use this or that for whatever purpose, but just keep that in mind. You know, our channels are where our content and our communication are organized and we can add to or take away as needed. Right. All right, so let's move to what is a shared channel. So we've kind of already talked a little bit about it, but just to rehash what it is, and this logo here is pertinent because you will see the use of this icon in Teams when you start using the shared channel, uh, it, just to call it out as a different channel, right? So essentially it's a collaboration space, but the, the real key part about shared channels and the reason the word shared is in it is that it can be reused in multiple places. So I think that's the, the one thing I would take away, if nothing else, is that whereas a, a normal channel, you can use it once in one place, that's it. You know, if you have a channel and you want to move it, well, you're going to have to figure out how to move it, but you can't have it in two or three or four different places and different people seeing it. Shared channels kind of revolutionizes that concept and it says we can have a channel and we can essentially repin it or reuse it in different places, which makes it suddenly very, very flexible and also very powerful. So you could say, well, I want to have a team and I want to have a channel within that. And I want someone in a whole other organization to also be able to see that channel, but without coming into our tenant at all. They just see that channel in the context of their own teams. That's fantastic. The other use case is you might have multiple teams in your own environment where you want to reuse that channel because that conversation is pertinent in a lot of different places, right? So instead of creating more teams just for the, the benefit of bringing people together, you can now create fewer teams, but repin these conversations multiple times. So you get a lot of value now instead of, you know, just the incremental value of one channel, you can multiply the value from that by kind of essentially allowing it to be leveraged in multiple places. Now, what was the buzz all about? You were you were there, I think. I think we were both at that at that ignite, Joy. Uh, you saw the buzz about this. What did you hear? Gosh. It was that the concept of it was phenomenal. I mean, the exciting course it was uh Teams Connect is what it right. was going to be until Slack, you know, had that name. But uh, yeah, just the idea of no more painful tenants switching. I think for me, I was like, oh, hallelujah. Because at the time I was in about 40 different tenants, not including <laughs> wow. like, the different Microsoft ones. So customer tenants, my my home tenant. So it, tenant switching is not as bad as it used to be. It used to be even worse. Yeah. So that was a big deal. Um, avoid oversharing. Sure, right? It gives you the ability to kind of make sure the right content is focused to the right people. Reduce teams proliferation. I have opinions on that. Sometimes a lot of teams isn't a bad thing if they're right. useful. If they're not useful. Anything that's not useful in my mind is kind of annoying. But um, we had a lot of kind of one-off cross-functional teams because Sometimes payroll and finance need to talk together on this thing. So we're going to create a cross-functional team for them. But they've all got their other teams already. And HR and safety, they need, right? So it's all those little cross-populated teams everywhere. Shared channels fixes 
that. We're going to show you a couple of ways as we go on how it can fix that. And we'll talk about the architectural implications too, because if you know me, you know I'm an architecture nerd. Um, <laughs> but it We're serves like a purpose. That. So that's yeah. okay. So there was a lot of buzz, right? I think it was, I think, one of the most um, most talked about announcements from Ignite 2021. And generally, it was almost like universal praise and acclaim. And it was like, finally, is what I heard from so many people. It's like, oh, finally, the answer to our prayers, right? Mm -hmm. And it sounded so great. And what they showed us was, you know, they didn't do a deep dive. They never do when they first tease these at Ignite you know, oh, look at how easy it is for me to take a channel, reshare it with Pradeep here, and now I have this channel in multiple places. And I think, I know I was really excited, like Joy as well, and a lot of customers we spoke to were like, wow, this is going to solve a ton of our external collaboration problems that we're currently facing. Then the announcement as things tend to go, you know, these are these are big architectural things that Microsoft is building, so it's, it's, not, it, it's not something that is um, unforgivable, but of course the delay was a little, there was a bit of a delay, I think, in the launch. And it eventually came into public preview. This is just a history lesson, uh, but kind of back in March 2022, just to give you a bit of a timeline. And immediately feedback was fairly mixed. We even did a survey at Orchestry of some of our customers to say, based on what you've seen in the public preview of this feature, are you thinking you're going to be able to use it? And you can see here that it's actually, it was really, really low. I wasn't really surprised. I was kind of expecting this based on my playing with it. Only yeah. one in five people actually said that they would use this feature based on what they knew. There were almost 40% saying they would not be able to use it because of the security concerns that we'll talk about a little bit later. And almost half of the people were honestly just confused and unsure. Right, and that's not uncommon again with big new releases from Microsoft. A lot of uncertainty and confusion come. Uh, this was one of them, right? But I think here there was this added layer that they had made it seem so simple during the Ignite, Ignite announcement. And when we saw it, it's like, this is extremely complicated. What happened? Yeah. Where, where did things change? <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, we're not quite a year into it. And I'm curious uh, if anyone is using shared channels yes. now in your organization, if you just want to do like a, put your hand up and the re or do a reaction or a clap or it's something, I'd be yes. curious if anyone on is. Um, it, it's just taken a little while to get traction. Uh, and I think as we go through and we look at the inner workings of how these things are wired, we'll kind of see why. And I'm not seeing any hands go up or anything. So we're all in the probably the 43 or the 37 percent of like, yeah, mm, just yeah. not sure about it yet. Yeah, I just posted a question. Uh, maybe we'll show up if anyone's used it. Let us know. But that's kind of the general <laughs> sense we're getting right. So let's talk a bit about how they work, and then we'll talk about how you can still use them and how there, there still may be a silver lining here, even if the security piece frightens you, <laughs> that there still may be use cases for you that are of interest. So let's look at shared channels. Now, shared channels under the hood, this is a bit technical, is powered by something called Azure B2B Direct Connect. So they kept the Connect name in the underlying Azure infrastructure service layer, Really what it allows you to do is to basically pull people in from various sources into the same holistic conversation. So I think the word that resonates the most for us is it gives us a lot of flexibility now. There's definitely a huge underpinning security piece as well, and it allows for some centralization. So let's have a look at actually what this means. So um, when we um, are putting in place shared channels, there's a bunch of limitations that you should first understand um, in terms of how does a shared channel compare or stack up against a regular channel? And I think the biggest one for me, uh, Joy, I don't know what you, what you think for you, but for me, the biggest one is this challenge that you cannot use it for guests. So you cannot invite a guest, like let's say you want to normally invite a guest at like joyapple at gmail.com uh, as a guest into your tenant and you're used to being able to do that. You cannot do that in a shared channel at all. So you do really have to think very carefully when you're implementing architecturally a shared channel. 
it will only work for allowing you to pull in people from other federated tenants in M365. So that's already a niche of people. And if you think that it's possible you would need to pull in guests right away, you should probably pause and not use a shared channel because you might have to restart and recreate something later. Yeah. And and as we go through the next few slides, you'll see why it's kind of a big deal. Uh, it's not just anyone with an email address that can come in to a shared channel. Uh, some of the other things that might be surprising is not all of the apps are going to be available in there. And just yeah. like a private channel, anything that is tied to that parent team's Microsoft 365 group isn't going to be something you can do in there because you're bringing right. in extra people. So that's important to keep in mind. And we are going to make these slides available. So as we go through, you'll notice we're not going to read every, every bullet point to you. Yeah. If you have a particular question, go to chat, raise your hand, call our attention if we miss it. Um, but we'll make the slides available. Yeah, it's it's just important to note, this is a special piece of functionality. Uh, so it's not going to act just like our standard channels and even to a certain degree, like private channels, like the notifications. Your missed activity emails are relying on mine to come through once an hour. That's not yeah. going to happen yeah. in your shared channels. So you got to, yeah, I have to actually pay attention. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And this is it's what rough. you do. It's Definitely rough. have to. Rough. <laughs> rough. <laughs> now, now what should be considered really quickly? Joy already alluded to some of these, but some big considerations here. Um, one is it's like a shared channel and that a, a, a dedicated SharePoint site collection gets created for the content. So you can end up, and this is not, a, to, to Joy's point earlier, this is not necessarily a bad thing, but architecturally, when you spin up either a private channel or a shared channel, it breaks off its own SharePoint site to have a dedicated repository there with its own security on it, of course, to support <laughs> the different membership. But you can end up theoretically having a team that's not now made up of just one site, but potentially 10 different sites, right? Depending on how far you go with this. So you Think a I mean, little you bit get 200 that. channels, right? Yeah, right. So this can blow up pretty quickly. And then not to say that that's catastrophic or bad. And Microsoft, to their credit, have done some things on the UX side to try to stitch these together. So they don't at least make it that visible that you're bouncing between different sites. They try to make it all kind of come together in that home team. But it's not perfect. Right. And can I just say, I love the icons and those in channel, that little yeah. view that's this inside of the default shared documents library. I love it. Mm. It's fabulous. The only thing I don't like about it is how they're using the same UX of folders as the no. section below. I wish it was subtly different somehow. Don't but. get me started on the F word. <laughs> That's Remember a whole that, other session. <laughs> remember also that these are irreversible decisions. If you make a shared channel yeah. or a private channel, it cannot be converted, right? So you do, again, pause and think about this one. All right, and let's talk a bit about adoption. Joy and I are big fans of adoption. So like, how good is a feature? If you can't roll it out, well, it's mm -hmm. pointless, mm -hmm. right? There's a few things that are really bit, a little bit p potentially problematic here. And I really think these, these really are worth thinking about. One is, we're adding a new type of channel for, for people to potentially be able to create. Did they even understand the difference between standard and private before? In my experience, I don't know about yours, Joy, but I talked to a lot of customers that looked at this and they said, well, of course, every channel should be private. I don't want the whole company to see it. Well, th that's not what that means, right? So there's already confusion over standard and private. Now we're adding a third one, mm -hmm. right? So that's, you know, potential adoption challenge. Right. Tom enabled chat. Yeah, we got chat. Excellent. People use the chat. Y'all better use it. <laughs> so here's a question too. Uh, new stuff rolls out. It hits the tenant. Users have it available to them. Who's taken the time to let them know? Right. So this is again. It goes back to us, kind of the concept of IT as a service to make sure. We're reaching out to the business users to let them know, hey, you're going to see this change. This is what it means. This is what will happen. Holla if you need us. And there might even be an opportunity to use a shared channel to support that activity. Ooh. Yeah. The, the other thing with shared channels, we found even as consultants, 
the experience for adding a shared channel is is not very intuitive. So if you you can share a shared channel with people, we'll talk about this later, but you can share it with specific people. You can share it with a team or with a team you own. Now with the with people and with the team you own work relatively as you would expect. But when you try to share a shared channel with a team, you don't actually come and search for a team. You actually have to search for the owner of that team to find those teams. It's a little bit weird. So basically you're not sharing it so much with a team as you're sharing it with a team owner. That's not At you. first. Right. So the, the experience also for using the shared channels can be a blocker. People can turn it on and they're like, this looked really cool, but I can't even wrap my head around how to use it. Right. And that's a challenge. All right. So I'll toss it over to you, Joy, and we'll talk about external collaboration. And then we'll talk about an interesting use case that doesn't even require any of the external uh, collaboration settings being turned on. But when this was first announced, really the fanfare, the publicity, the marketing was really around, guess what? Now you can directly converse and share and collaborate with other yes. people in other companies right within your own team's environment. So that's where we're going to start. No tenant switching, but yeah. it takes a little work. Uh, see, Tom says, I checked two tenants, no shared channels. Um, yes, I believe it is on by default, and then you have to go turn it off by policy. We'll look at those screens as we go. So you have to, number one, to be able to turn on the external sharing component or to share a channel with another organization, you either have to be an Azure AD admin or you have to be friends with your Azure AD admin, <laughs> right? If you're not friends with that person, I highly recommend call them up, find Those out what friends. their favorite snack or alcoholic beverages, sneak them little goodies. Oh, wait, if, it's, if we're still remote, just send them like a, a Starbucks gift card through Teams. Yeah. Right. Yes. Do it because you have to go into Azure AD and turn on a tenant to tenant. Oh, shoot. What's it called? It just left my brain. We've got a picture of it. Yeah. Uh, cross tenant or something like that. Both tenants have to trust each other to get this to work. Because we're sharing membership, we're sharing, you know, people and hopefully people we trust and potentially sharing applications. Right. So it's definitely a matter of trust. Policies have to be in place. It has to be enabled in Teams first or at some point. You, you can do the AD first or you can do the, the Teams piece first. It doesn't matter. It is on by default. Um, but you've got to be able to have the inbound and the outbound cross-tenant access settings configured. That may be a hard sell. Um, I think it's worth it. I truly do. Not for every every thought, uh, but I feel and we'll look at some use cases. There's some areas where that could seriously be worth it. How likely is it with highly regulated companies? I think it's going to come down to individual company culture. I truly, truly do. Now, if you're if you're talking what's well, not even available for GCC or GCC high at this point. Sorry, uh, Joe. Yeah, but um. Yeah, that's just where it is. And there's the screenshot of what has to be turned on to be able to allow it. I think the the tricky thing, just digging into Casey's point here, is that to actually turn this on with uh, other tenants, other organizations, you have to basically trust them. There has to be mutual trust between your tenant and their tenant. Otherwise, this whole thing breaks apart. Because in the back end, we're letting the Azure AD from another person's tenant connect with ours. That's the underlying principle here of the, the whole reason this can work, right? Is that we trust them, we trust yep. their users, and we actually, we're not prompting them to log in or anything like that again. We're trusting their current authentication that they've already done, right? So this is usually the deal breaker for a lot of companies. As they look at this, they see mutual trust and they say, we can't trust anyone. Right. We we barely trust anyone within our own company, let alone people outside our company. Right. But what do so, you want to bet? What do you want to bet those same companies have links that are shared with, you know, Gmail accounts or I'm just saying it. I I feel like this is the safer route or route, depending on where you live to go. 
as opposed to just bringing in anybody and sharing things and are we sharing from one drive and stuff this there's security here there truly is it's not a free for all it's and it's you can point. even lock it down to be just particular users or groups inside of that other tenant not right. anyone right. that works at acmecorp.com right an area where I see initial uptake making a lot of sense is this idea of like a parent company with subsidiary companies yeah. or a, a, an umbrella company that owns a ton of other companies. With those, I can see the argument being much easier to make, right? We're, we're all part of one big family already, so the mutual yep. trust is usually not as big of a deal, right? I can see or that. a bank, you're going to do I used to work in the financial industry, hated it, yeah. uh, and we went through audits quite regularly. Our auditor right. had been a former interrogator for the military. That was fun. Nice. Yeah. So you could have a channel where you let those auditors come in and just move files into that channel, something like that, where they can come in, do what they need to do and go. That that yeah. would be clean, I feel. Okay. Yeah. Done. So we we won't like it like we said we won't go in depth on how to turn this on but we want to make sure we have at least the the rough pathway if you're going to try to follow this. So as Joy said, you first have to turn it on. You have to add an organization that you want to trust. The interesting thing is you can actually search for organizations to trust. All you need to know is their domain name or their Azure tenant ID. So the domain name interestingly you can just punch in whatever at whatever.com or even a dot, a dot on microsoft.com you'll, you'll get the tenant name as well as the tenant id and now i'm not aware of anything Shocking. nefarious people can do with the tenant id but it is a little interesting that they expose it um, so that is interesting you then need to go and do all this stuff around uh, setting inbound access rules turning them on then you have to do the same for outbound microsoft rightly says hey are you sure you want to do this and then are you, sure? you, you kind of say yes but then this is the piece that is, is tricky, right? So once you've turned it on, that's not even all of the fight, right? Joy, there's this whole other step now that you have to do. Yeah, I think we spent about an hour going, okay, okay, wait, wait, what did you see? What did you get? <laughs> what did you do? So you see step seven, David is like, okay, well, I'm gonna invite Joy at her Joy SharePoint tenant to come in. So we sent the invite, the invite was sent. I saw a little activity that said pop up says view have been invited. Ooh, okay. And you have the option when you're invited, inviting from your tenant to another tenant, a person. This is right, right? A person or a team. Yeah. If you do the person experience, it's not awesome. But if you do the team experience, then that notification came to me. It came, yeah. I got a little activity blip. I went in here and I accepted and I went through an authorization thing. Do you want to allow this tenant to da, 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 da. Of course I do. I know David, I trust David and that tenant. And then I got to choose which team I wanted to pen the channel into. Now, don't be thinking if you've got a group of people <laughs> yeah, we this was fun. Oh, we'll, we'll just create a team and it'll be like the trash team or the annoying customer team or the horrible vendor team. And anytime <laughs> they send us something, we'll just put them all there. Don't do it. Because as soon as I accepted it, we waited and we waited and David figured out. How did you finally figure out? Because it was like another step had to be done. There's yeah, this part to me is is really bizarre. That it's after so after I had sent the request to Joy and her tenant, and then Joy accepted. Furthermore, then it came back to me to accept it again. But the weird thing was, I got no notification of any kind. I actually had to oh. know to open up the shared channel, click on manage channel, click on the sent invites, and then I saw, oh look at this, weird. There's a pending request from Joy. That doesn't make sense. I already told Joy she could use the shared channel. I guess I have to approve it again. So I think what they're doing here is they're saying they want the original sender of the shared channel to approve where Joy has put it in her tenant. In and my own tenant. That surprised us quite a bit. Like we were both of the opinion, like why, why should I get to decide where Joy puts the shared channel? Once I've said she can use it, go ahead. But it, whatever reason, I had to then click approve. 
And then the connection is finally made. And this is as where, as Joy said, I get to see the name of the team where Joy has put it. So be careful where you're putting it, uh, not into the, um, you know, nonsensical babble team where yes. you're putting all these channels. And what'd you call it the first time though? I don't remember. Toilet team. He called it the toilet team. The people. toilet team. Yeah, the toilet team. That's <laughs> true. You're getting into toilet humor. That's we're, we're in good shape. But ultimately, what does it look like? The nice thing about this, once you've gone through all of those hoops, and there are some hoops, you do have an interesting potential experience here. So like imagine a scenario where let's say I work for Contoso. Okay. I work for this company and we're working on redesigning our website. So I spin up a team for that and I have a bunch of my normal channels where I'm working on people within my team to kind of gather requirements, kind of gather assets that we might need. What does our current site look like? And then we've hired this other company. We've hired this company called Oreo Cookie Consulting to basically help us with this. And they're gonna do two things for us. They're gonna do a current website assessment and a voice of the customer exercise. And I've created those as shared channels, as you can tell by the icons. I've shared them and then on their tenant, look at this, they have a team called, oh, a project for Contoso and we're doing their website rebuild. We also have our own internal channels where maybe we'll talk about the customer and say mean things about them. But then we have the shared channels that we see the same thing as. So everything happening in this channel is tied to what is being seen over here. Then that's you the nice thing about this. Little icon, right? The private channel gets a padlock. This gets that little interlocking situation. Right. So that's kind of how it can be done. And it can be, there's a lot of scenarios where this is cool, right? This is very cool because now instead of me previously, if I was on this team, I would have had to tenant switch to go over and see what was happening here. Now I'm still within my own tenant. I'm even within the context of an existing team that makes sense to me. And I can see the content and the conversation that's happening here. This is quite powerful once you get past all the rest of it. Yeah, it, it, it's once you know what to expect um, with the invites. And if you if you invite a person instead of a team from another, then that person gets this fake team kind of stubbed out in their teams with that channel down there. No general channel, nothing like that. It's just that one thing. And I, I couldn't do anything with it in my tenant. It just was there and it was awkward. Very awkward. Yeah. It, it is a bit of a strange scenario, but yeah, to, to Joy's point, you can also share channels just as like floating channels with individual people uh, if you want, but it's it's a bit of a weird experience, probably not my first choice. Yeah. Now, you might have looked at that and said, well, the end result looked good, David and Joy, but the mutual trust, I'm never going to get that past my cybersecurity team. It's not never going to happen. Is there anything else we can do with this? Actually, yes, there are some interesting ways you can use this internally and still get a lot of value from that pinning or reuse concept. So we'll think about it this way. Internally, you might want to you know, reduce content duplication and unnecessary team creation. And rather than creating multiple teams to do similar things, which we used to have to do, we can now basically create that reusable component of that team as a shared channel and then put it in a number of different teams for people to be able to access and participate in. So let's show you some examples. We're actually big fans of shared channels internally at Orchestry. We have a, a kind of silly use of them in, to some, in, in some respects in our naming convention, but we do use them quite a bit. So we have like an Orchestry product team, a marketing team, and a customer success team. And you'll notice that a bunch of these channels are reused. And this is really helpful for me and Joy and Michael and others because we can still st stay kind of within the context of our teams. In some cases, we might not even have access to these other teams themselves, but we can see the content from the shared channel within our team. So for example, a customer escalation shared channel I have in, in, in the product team, I have visibility into, I can see. Joy can also have access to it in her team. And if ever I didn't even have access to her team, I could actually still participate in the conversation. I see fewer teams. Everything is kind of in its place. It's very helpful. Yeah. And so like the, the one that's down there, customer and partner success, I'm an owner of that. It owns several of those shared channels. So like so 
Portopolis. See, I don't really say them out loud that often. You know, kind of <laughs> practice that. Uh, we wanted Sarah and the devs to be able to have access to it, but they really don't care about all the other chat we've got going on in there. Mm -hmm. So they're not bound to that. They don't have to hide or manage their notifications. When we need to throw up the bat signal, we do it there. We can have conversations and it keeps things very clean for the other folks. Yeah, exactly. That's good. It's a good point. We we have to be cognizant of the noise we're creating, right? And so I think the the the, love, the more we can reduce the noise for people, the more happy they will be. Yes. So how do you set it up? It's really easy. You just go add a channel. Now there's just like the third option. If you have it enabled in your tenant and you can go and create this shared channel and it's as easy as that. And then I think Joy has a, I think this is a video. It is a video. Probably have to click. There we go. I'm clicking. Okay. This there is kind of a quick walkthrough. Yep. So support, I'm going to share the channel. This was my tenant. I'm the only person there, so I'm sharing it with a team that I own because I own them all. It would have been the same experience or which other one. So I'm going to share that. So HR has a support line. It thinks about it for just a minute. Great. And then the activity kind of pops up that it happened. And then once the screen refreshes, that support channel shows up underneath HR. So right. I've got it under the helpful desk and also under HR. So that's a as a very limited use case, but that could be the ability where our primary department teams have a channel where they can chat with support. That's a really good use case. We have, I think, three or four main ones that we kind of just want to share for for ideas, and maybe you guys have ideas as well. Um, one great use case, I think, is this idea of like an AMA support or Q&A type channel that is functional in nature. So let's say IT or marketing, for example, wants to have a place that people can come from anywhere in the company and ask questions like about branding, like, hey, is this logo the right logo or am I using the right font in this presentation or do I have the right version of our brand deck, right? Instead of having this happen by email and all and, and no one has visibility into it, so they're answering the same questions a million times, you could create this as a shared channel that is actually owned by marketing. So marketing can see this channel in their team and then it can be repinned anywhere else where they tend to get questions, right? So maybe in a project that's client facing, they want to turn that shared channel on and then people can come here, ask me anything, ask the marketing team what you need and the marketing team just has a single place to monitor. That's the key part. Really useful. Absolutely. You can also we can also do this kind of from a like a topic based angle, right? So I really like the kind of scenario and Yammer is good at this too. If you're using Yammer, great, but a lot of companies aren't. This idea of champions communities or communities of practice or power users, whatever you call them internally, right? This can be great use of a shared channel. So for example, maybe you have a teams champions group where you internally you have some power users that are driving uh, some of the usage of teams. And you want to repin that channel in every new project that gets created because you have a lot of new users. They're ramping up into teams. They have a lot of questions and it's really useful for them to have just an open space where they can ask questions about how to use teams properly. Right. I think you've used this as well, Joy. Right. This yeah. idea. Absolutely. And it's another again, this isn't really something in. Communication, communicate, communicate, over communicate. We're not trying to replace the help desk, mm -hmm. but not everything is a ticket. Probably not everything should be a ticket, right? So how do I, I need help. And if it is appropriate to be a ticket, just make that kind of an SLA thing that the help desk has a right to say, you need to put in a ticket for this and, and put the link in, just have it as a standard response. And here's the link to submit a ticket. Uh, but a lot of a lot of good stuff could come through this. It could even be a channel where IT pushes announcements out to groups by using this channel. Hey, we are enabling this functionality. This is what's going to be different. Here's a KB article on it. Right. And I will say one thing real quick. There's room at the table for, for this in Yammer, right? As uh, Dan Holm says, Teams is where we make the sausage. Yammer is where we go to the organization as a whole and say, look at this awesome thing we did, right? It's how we connect 
at a, at a larger scale than just in these little pockets of communication and information. Yeah, that's that's fair point. That's a fair point. Another another use case similar, but there's slight, slight, subtly different as well, is this idea of kind of a, a patterns of practice or best practices type channel. I think project immediately comes to mind because it's an easy one that everyone mm -hmm. understands. But mm -hmm. let's say you have a PMO, project management office, and they're constantly updating their templates, their best practices, they're, they're doing lessons learned on projects, and they want to get the word out for the other projects. Hey, we had a really great lesson that we were able to learn during our last three projects. We don't want everyone to repeat the same mistake. We want everyone to know about it. It's a little bit hard from a knowledge management perspective sometimes to get the word out on these types of things. And this could be a way that is quite useful, where again, I have a shared channel here called PMO Best Practices, and it's just getting pinned or reused in every project. And that way there's a, a, a channel, a way to push out messaging around, hey guys, we have a new risk register method. This is the way that we found the most successful for logging risks, and it's been very, you know, uh, highly uh, taken up by our users. We'd love you guys to use it and give us feedback on it. So where better to have this mm -hmm. conversation than in the context of the projects that are currently running? And, you know, on the kind of the slide we were transitioning over, uh, we mentioned that this can, is also a central, centralized way to communicate with people. And also, it appears to me there's a files tab. This would also be a great place to put templates that every project needs if we're if we're using the project example uh documentation that everyone's yeah. going to need and we don't want to have it duplicated in every project team so it could just be shared centrally from one location so a few different ways this could be useful yeah very useful yeah, yeah totally agree um, can we disable it i mean just i i, I think both joe and, joe and i would say well don't just do it out of hand, think about it. But yes, you can disable it even for the internal use case like we just showed, right? So the ability to create shared channels can be completely turned off. And that might be why some of you don't see it at all as an option. That's because someone in your organization adheres to Grinchy governance. No Grinches, <laughs> right? And we'll bring it back. I should I should have brought the I should have brought the image to post in. Right. Uh, but there's good use cases for it. It doesn't have to be terrifying and i get it I, I used to be a server admin right it can be terrifying and sometimes if we're already overworked we want to just go nope turn it off don't do it leave it out there there's really good functionality and capabilities here you don't have to open it up to every to every tenant on the globe right you can't even just use it internally try it you might like it yeah <laughs> like forbidden fruit <laughs> okay, so Joy, you did some great thinking here about like, okay, what type of channel should I use when? Do you want to walk us yes. through this? Yes, yeah, this is where the trainer in me starts to come out a little bit. So the question is, all right, now I got three channels I've got to pick from. How do I know when to use what? Or how do I help my business users decide when to use what? And thank you, by the way, David, for, for answering the question about the no problem. Um, so we got a team. We've got lots of teams probably. And now we've got this new stuff. And I always feel like I want to hold it in my hand. I've got this stuff and I don't know what to do with it. Do I need a standard channel, a private channel, a shared channel? What do I need? Well, as we're thinking about that stuff, is everyone that needs to have access to the stuff and we're going to talk with about the stuff are they already in the same team? And is it a breach of security? Right, I came out of the government, right? I see you, Joe. Is it a breach of security if everyone in that same team sees this content or the conversation around it? So that's where we're gonna start, right? So we got the stuff. What if, what if everyone is already in the same team? And it's no big deal, it's okay. If everyone sees it and they're part of the conversation, standard channel, you might even have a channel already that fits the bill. Here where I see a lot of a lot of folks err on the side of caution or they mean well is they're like, well, I'm still going to make it a private channel and only add the people that I think care about it 
because I'm trying to limit the amount of notifications that they get. That's very kind. Don't do it. I've gotten many, many help calls from customers that have done that. Now, Planner does it work and they can't all get to the, all the other stuff and they go to this other site and where's all the other channels? The content's gone, right? If you're worried about notifications, talk to your people. Be very honest. Say, I understand that 50% of you don't care. Yeah. Mute the notifications for the new channel or hide it. Mute. If we need you, we will at mention you, right? It's I, okay. I love I'd love to see stats, Joy, on how many people use the muting because I think it's not a well-known right? feature. Right? Don't don't let your notifications manage you. Yeah. You are in charge. Uh, we may not have time. I'm going to still tell my Pavlov dog story. <laughs> During the first year of COVID, we didn't have COVID real long in Oklahoma, right? So by the summer. We could go to our restaurants. They were still like social distancing and kind of spaced out and all that good stuff. But it was a summer night. My husband and I were at our favorite Mexican restaurant. We were having cocktails. It's probably about eight o'clock at night and I hear teens. And what do I do? Where's my phone? Where's my phone? Where's my phone? Where's my phone? I get my phone. <laughs> Not me. So now I'm nosy. I'm like, oh, who else is using Teams? Who's using Teams? I'm looking around. Nobody's going to their phone. I look up. It's the Microsoft commercial on the TV. I was Pavlov's dog. I heard teams. I jumped. Uh, it's like I put my margarita down and I went to teams, right? That's not healthy. Manage your notifications. Okay. So we've already decided that, yes, standard channel. Yeah. Well, what about we've got our stuff? Is everyone in the team already there that needs to see it? Uh huh. Or oh, sorry. No, this one's no. This one's no. I need to bring in extra people. Because it is a, nope, nope, nope. Which side are we on? I'm sorry. I took my glasses off. Now I can't read. Is everyone yeah. already in the same team? This no. is the use case for share channel. We should have put this one last, but we put it second. Yeah, I thought it was last. That's why, that's why I'm confused. Okay. That's, that's my, not my normal pace. So I need to add people to the channel that can see it, but it's okay if the people in the team see it. And that's where we can bring extra folks in. So maybe it is the human resources department, and this is the recruitment channel that they want to share with all the managers in the company. So we can bring in extra people from other teams. You don't have to add that visibility to the whole team. You have options right. there. So right. a shared channel not shared with the original team wins here. And then I've got stuff. I got to figure out what to do with this stuff. Is everybody already in the team? Uh-huh. Is it a breach of security if everyone in the team sees it? Uh-huh. <laughs> That's when we go to a private channel, right? David and I were talking about this earlier. We have the exact same, you know, first use case that comes to mind because uh, we're consultants. Right? We came out of that world. We've got our project team. But we need a place for like the project manager and maybe the person that does the billing and the invoices. We need a place where they have con can have conversations about invoicing, billing, maybe change orders. Yeah. And it is not OK for the consultants that are working on the project to see that information. Right. It is a breach of security. So we need that cubbyhole that's private. I've I've received many a call where a customer built a team for a department and then every functional business area in the department, they made a private channel and they hated it because they just, they didn't have room to organize their content. They did really deep folder structure. So search was awful and the performance was slow. They couldn't share planner, right? There's a time and a place for everything. If we need to bring in extra people, that's our shared channel. Yeah. If we need to remove folks and have a subset, that's a private channel. If you're in the team, you're on the team. That's a standard channel. Yeah, I think that's that's useful. And I think thinking about too, like, is this channel, does it have the potential to be reused or used elsewhere? Think, you know, think about that question. The privacy and the security will trump everything ultimately and direct you, which, you know, Joy has in her questions. But if you think, yeah, you know what, this is a conversation that, if I go down this path, I'm going to be creating one of these 
in every team, then you probably should stop, right? Yep. Think about a shared channel might, might be a much better solution where I can just look in a single place, everyone sees the same feed of information, could be really, really useful. I always fall back on my SharePoint days, and I, I came to this very early on in my career, still during the Moss days. Build for security first. Yeah. Don't build by the org chart. Build by your processes, and those processes are going to be governed by roles, and roles are governed by security, and then it's, it'll work out pretty darn well when you go from there. All right, so any questions that we didn't answer? Uh, oh, we just got one. Um, can it be embedded in a Teams template? Right now, it depends, it depends what you mean by a Teams template. Right now, if you do, at least the last time I checked, if you try to do a copy using the native functionality, if you try to do a copy from a, an existing team, the shared channel gets left behind. Um, mm -hmm. So in most templating scenarios that, that I'm aware of, the shared channel currently is going to get left behind. And I think that is being done deliberately by Microsoft because of that like the last step of approval where they want the owner of the original shared channel, the owner, the creator of the original shared channel to have a voice or have some say in where that channel is getting reused. And so allowing the template to bring it in is kind of bypassing that a little bit right now. So I think you'll find that in most cases, this is not going to do what you want it to do. But it's something I know we're looking at at Orchestra because we want to uh, support templating shared channels and we're going to look at ways if the API can support it, ways that maybe if there's an approval that could be part of the template, but maybe there's an approval that goes to someone and says, hey, this has been added. Are you OK with it or something like that? Right. And I just confirmed I just did one and only the standard channels came over. Yeah. And I Thinking about it too, because when you're doing that, you're truly starting from that Microsoft 365 group as the template. And then yeah. anything that group has access to is what gets brought over. It's so well, sneaky. It's an onion. While we're taking, while you and people are thinking about more questions, this will share as well. These is just like a, a huge pile of links to, to really good reading. One of them that I would call out that's interesting is something called the Cross-Tenant Access Activity Workbook, which is available from Azure, from Microsoft. And you can use this to actually see, once if you do turn this on, that is to say, uh, to see the activity uh, and what is happening with that cross-tenant, like which tenants are coming in, who from those tenants are coming in, what are they doing? Are you know? Does it make sense that we have this turned on, right? So you can. There is some 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 help material out there. This is a great one. I would look at this link right here. Cross tenant access activity workbook. But there's a lot of great reading here as well that gets into much more depth on turning it on, much more than we could cover today. So now, does I'm, anyone? Uh, say, does anyone think they're going to go? take a peek at uh, turning on some shared channels or talking to their admin folks, maybe, possibly. Yes. Does this change anything? Yeah, yes, David, we will be sharing, all the slides will be shared and there's, there's a bunch that we actually skimmed over quite quickly. So yes, they'll all be there. But yeah, I'm curious, does this change anything for anyone, especially maybe the internal scenario, like seeing the use of reusing channels internally without the security concern. Has that piqued anyone's interest? Interesting. I love it, love it. Oh, Joe, yeah. Hey, it. hey, it's a step, right? It doesn't always Seizure. make sense to share externally. So we get it, we get it. Admins are paid to be paranoid, so I get it. Awesome. Thank you, Rijan, another uh, fellow a fellow Frenchman, Rijan Thibault. Uh, Great name. Yeah, this is why I don't even try to pronounce anything French when you're around. <laughs> I'm not even going to put myself through that. OK, I think we have to um, suggest this. Um, yes. Michael has a question. Maybe we'll answer that one before we do this. Maybe so we apply to naming channels. policies, I think, is something uh, alluded to in, in one of our slides but we didn't really talk about in much depth let me see if i can go back and find it but i think there is value like in this case what i did is i actually put shared at the end of the shared channel uh, mm -hmm. as part of the name of the channel now the 
Arguably, yes, the icon is there. Will everyone notice it? Probably not. Not everyone will know what it is. So I think one thing to think about is, it, is it worthwhile? I think it probably is to somehow label your shared channels differently yes. from the others. And maybe it's a yes. prefix, right? Maybe it's shared in brackets at the beginning or public. I, I think it, it, the, you do run the risk, especially when you first roll this out, that people do not understand the different people that are here versus the people that are here, just off the top of their head. So they go and they're just doing you know, their normal business. They go and drop a file in one of these. They're not thinking about it. Oops, that was in the shared channel with the external folks. Wasn't supposed mm -hmm. to be shared with them. So definitely making that more visible is probably a good idea. Through a naming convention would be something. I think another thing would be great for the for Microsoft to make this UX a little bit more prominent. Somehow that would I think also help people visually see these channels are different, right? All right. I think Tom helped me out. There's a couple things we would love. One is feedback. Um, we would love to get feedback on the session. Uh, we would love that. It, it only helps us do better for next time. And also of uh, interest is probably the raffle. Everyone should uh, enter. There's a pretty cool prize here, so you can scan this QR code or you can hit this link. Again, it will be in the slides we'll share as well, or you can try to try to get there now. But I think uh, yeah, Tom's helping me out with posting some of these in the chat. Yes, thank and you, I, thank think, I think that's it. Questions. We just want to thank, thank everyone for, for joining us today. Yep. This is us on social. Hope you're connect. Thanks for supporting uh, M365 Philly. It's always a great event with great moderators. They're just the best. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. That was an excellent session. Uh, definitely something to think about for sure with these shared channels, how to use them. I like it. I I like hey. the idea. Just need to see, you know, how to use it properly. So thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Joy. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Um, we're going to take a quick break and we will get set up for the next session. So we'll see you at one o'clock. All right. All right. Bye. All right. Bye. Thank you so much. Stay safe. Take care.